Uh, welcome everyone to this session on AI for Science. Uh, very happy to be here in this beautiful campus. Today's session might be slightly different to some of the others that you've been to so far. Um, we are definitely going to talk about AI for Science and the AI models that we've built at Google DeepMind, but we thought we'd take a slightly different approach. We're going to focus on describing how we go about selecting AI problems in science to work on, and then how do we leverage those foundational models to then benefit applications and scientific fields beyond that. So we are part of the Google DeepMind science team, and this is our mission. We leverage AI to perceive breakthroughs in impactful scientific challenges. Now, as I mentioned, we are going to talk about the scientific challenges that we work on at Google DeepMind, but I'm going to give you a bit of a sneak peek in that we would love to hear what challenges you would like to see AI apply to. So we're going to come back to this question at the end of the session, but keep this in mind. And we would love to hear specifically AI challenges that may be local to you in the Mediterranean or in the places that you call home that you would like to see AI apply to. So keep that in mind that we'll come back to that later. A quick look at the agenda today. So we'll spend a few minutes giving an introduction to the Google DeepMind Science Program. And that will talk a little bit about how we go about choosing scientific problems to work on, what we call root node problems. I'll then talk a bit about our, how we establish paths to impact or how we, how we leverage those foundational scientific problems and solutions to then have impact across many different fields and industries. We'll then come back to that question of what challenges you would like to see AI applied to. And then we'll wrap up and have plenty of time for Q&A. I know we're at the end of the session, end of the day, really. Uh, congrats for making it this far. We'll make sure that we wrap up on time and maybe a little bit early as well. Before we jump in, uh, a bit of a additional introduction, I guess. Hi, my name is Sarah Lee. Um, I lead Scratchy for the AI for Science team at Google DeepMind. Um, as was mentioned earlier, I have a bit of a mixed background. So my first degree was in math. I then did a master's and PhD in bioengineering. Um, initially wanted to become a career academic, changed my mind halfway through my PhD, which might resonate with some people. I then decided to go work in industry, worked in data science for a couple of years. And then I joined Google DeepMind five years ago. And I focus on strategy, which means that I work with our research leads and demos to figure out which scientific problems do we want to invest in and work on. And then how do we leverage those solutions to have impact for the broader community? And I hand over to Annette to introduce this all. Thanks, yeah. Um, again, another reintroduction, but my name's Annette. I'm a program manager on the AI for Science Research Program at Google DeepMind. Um, my background is more in psychology and business. So I did my MBA a couple of years ago. And I've been at DeepMind for just over seven years. And in that time, worked across a variety of different projects in AI for physics, biology, and chemistry. And my role, similar to Thurindi, I focus a lot more on kind of the operations and strategy behind what we do, and also project managing our research projects to make sure we're moving towards our goals efficiently and maximizing our impact. Um, okay, so Thurindi already kind of introduced what our mission is, which is essentially to transform the way that we do scientific discovery using AI. And the way we do that uh, is basically by choosing to focus on these kind of root node scientific problems. And so if you imagine something like the tree of life, where at the bottom you have these kind of root nodes, really complex scientific challenges that if solved could potentially unlock many downstream applications in the branches and the leaves. So take protein folding, for example, is one such uh, root node challenge that we are really interested in Google DeepMind. And obviously that has many downstream benefits for humanity in healthcare, but also in specifically in synthetic biology, protein design, drug design, disease understanding, and so on. And then another example of a root node challenge we're really interested in at DeepMind is quantum chemistry, which again, we feel like if we were to solve some of the challenges in that domain, that could potentially unlock many downstream applications. And uh, there are a few other kind of uh, root node domains that we think uh, AI could help unlock many challenges in. And so this is the current AI for science portfolio at Google DeepMind. Um, we are very interested in AI for computer science, using AI to understand the genome, AI for fusion and neuroscience, 
uh, protein structure prediction and quantum chemistry I already mentioned, and we'll talk a little bit more about those today. And we're also interested in AI for maths and weather and climate. And so these are some kind of key domain areas that we think uh, AI could be leveraged to help unlock some really interesting impactful challenges for humanity. And so how do we go about choosing which root nodes to essentially focus on? Well, there's actually a lot of thought and research and discussion that goes into choosing which domains we think we could have the most impact in. But there are three main things we look at when it comes to problem selection. The first is, is there high scientific significance and impact? The second is, is there availability of data or simulated data for us to learn from? And the third is, is there a clear objective function or success metric uh, for us to measure how well we're doing and also for us to know when the problem would actually be solved? And so these are some of the main things we consider when we choose a, a root node to, to pursue. And when pursuing those, we take a very multidisciplinary approach. Um, so we collaborate very closely with domain experts, and we actually have a lot of scientific domain experts working in the team at Google DeepMind. And we also take a very mission-focused approach. So we hone in on these domain areas for the long term, and we form kind of expert teams on these areas and really go deep um, and focus on trying to have impact in them uh, as much as possible. And so to bring this to life a little bit more, I'm going to dive into a specific case study, which is AI for quantum chemistry, which I mentioned already is an area that we're really passionate about at Google DeepMind. And I'm going to apologize in advance for any quantum chemists in the audience for the very oversimplified uh, explanations I'm going to give. Uh, but we'll start at the very high level. What is quantum chemistry? Essentially, it's just trying to understand chemistry by calculating the energy of electrons across different states. And there's plenty of reasons why understanding quantum chemistry is super interesting and important. And some of the reasons that we care about, particularly DeepMind, are related to some really fundamental challenges that we think, if unlocked, could have widespread impact across society. So for example, there are many industrial processes that rely on um, chemical reactions. For example, the Haber-Bosch process, which is responsible for producing ammonia, and uh, ammonia is used in fertilizer, which obviously has many implications for food supply and agriculture. Uh, but this process is currently incredibly energy intensive, and I think is responsible for about 500 million tons of CO2 released into the air every year. But if we were able to uh, mimic the way that nature does this, by a catalyst or an enzyme, we'd be able to significantly reduce how energy intensive this process is and have a huge impact. Similarly, in solar power, quantum chemistry is used to try and make photovoltaic cells far more efficient. Photovoltaic cells are responsible for transferring light into energy. And uh, if we were able to do this far more efficiently, then you know, solar power could become a much more viable resource and much more widely adopted. And then similarly, in battery design, quantum chemistry methods are used to make much more efficient batteries, which of course has many applications in the en energy industry and in transportation. And there are many more applications um, that are really exciting in the quantum chemistry space. You could even say that equations for how electrons and nuclei interact pretty much underpin all of modern science. Uh, but the challenge with quantum chemistry is that many of our existing quantum chemistry methods either struggle with accuracy because the quantum world is very strange and difficult to predict, or they don't scale very well when it comes to really large and complex molecules, which is actually where a lot of the exciting and useful chemistry happens in the real world. And so we need a much more practical way of describing quantum mechanics so that we can understand the dynamics of complex molecules without too much computation. And there is uh, one such kind of theory that aims to describe quantum mechanics in a slightly more efficient way. It's density functional theory, or DFT. Um, I'll explain this very briefly. I won't go into the details, but essentially it's a theory that was developed or discovered back in the 60s. And uh, it basically says that you can calculate the the properties of a molecule by averaging over the density of all the electrons in the system, as opposed to calculating the interaction of each electron and how it interacts with other electrons and nuclei, which would otherwise be incredibly energy, uh, computationally intensive. And uh, so because it's far more efficient method, there's some other quantum uh, mechanical methods 
uh, many scientists use DFT in their research and computational chemistry and material science. And some might say it's, it's pretty much the workforce of all modern computational chemistry and material science. And so, um, yeah, yeah, scientists can use this method to basically get out quantum mechanical descriptors related to their application. And it's so widely used that actually 12 of the top 100 cited papers of all time are related to DFT, and two of those are in the top 10. And Becky, who is one of the authors of those top two papers, says that the applications are endless. At a fundamental level, DFT can be used to describe all of chemistry, biochemistry, biology, nanosystems, and materials. And everything in our terrestrial world depends on notions of electrons, and therefore DFT literally underlies everything. And so in there lies our first requirement of having high scientific significance and impact. The challenge, though, with uh, DFT is that although it is uh, far more efficient than some of the other quantum chemistry methods, because it does average over the overall density, it can sometimes struggle with accuracy in many cases. And so the idea that we are trying to pursue is using machine learning to try and make it just as accurate as well as efficient. And so the idea is that you can create a neural network that can basically learn this mapping from density to energy. And so that's basically the task that we're trying to do in terms of exactly what that looks like. So the training data consists of electron densities and labels of energy, which have been derived from either experimental observations or there are some, as I mentioned, more clunky quantum mechanics methods that don't scale well when it comes to large and complex molecules, but many scientists have used to label small and simple molecules. And that in conjunction with the experimental observations kind of forms our, our training data uh, and forms of kind of supervised density to energy regression task. And in there lies our second requirement of the availability of data or simulated data for learning. And then in terms of what are the inductive biases that enable us to make sure we're learning the right thing? As I mentioned at the beginning, I'm not a computer scientist, so I won't punish you all by trying to describe the intricacies of the model architecture. But what I do know is that we, we really do bake in kind of bespoke chemical knowledge about symmetries, constraints, locality, many of these kind of um, quantum chemistry domain specific uh, requirements. And that's why a, a multidisciplinary approach is really key here to bring together the best of both the, the scientific domain and machine learning. In terms of how we evaluate, well, luckily for us, there are um, a number of kind of community accepted benchmark data sets where it's considered, if you do well on those, your, your method is considered a good one and achieving an error less than one kilocalorie per mole is considered to be chemically accurate. And so in there lies our third and final requirement for problem selection, which is making sure there's a clear objective function and success metric for us to measure our progress. And uh, so that is essentially what we're trying to do. The idea is that we could have essentially a single universal neural network that scientists could use to feed in the density of any molecule and uh, use that to calculate the quantum mechanic descriptors that are really relevant for applications. And we've made some progress in this area. So in 2021, we published and open sourced our first general purpose machine learning, machine learned density functional, and uh, it achieved state of the art accuracy across a broad range of chemistry um, on some of those benchmark data sets that I mentioned before. But also, and this is where collaborating with domain experts was really key, we also managed to solve some of the kind of long-standing systematic errors of existing functionals in this space. If you want to learn a bit more about the model or anything else we did there, the, the link to the reference is at the bottom of the slide. Um, okay, so I think it's probably fair to say that the road to DM21 and releasing this functional wasn't completely easy. Um, so I'd like to also share some of the challenges and learnings uh, that went along the way. But before I do that, I'd like to ask you what you think might have been the challenges in trying to uh, solve a problem like this with machine learning. Um, so now some time for some interaction. It's the end of the day, so um, we can all get a bit active. So if you could either scan the QR code if you've got a smartphone, or you can just head to slido.com and enter the number at the top of the screen. And it'd be great if you could, yeah, share your thoughts on what you think some of the main challenges might be in trying to solve a problem like this with machine learning. 
and we'll try and get the answers up on the slides. If not, I will read them out. Let's see. We'll get the QR code up again for you to see. There we go. We'll give you a couple of minutes. Okay. Great, I can see some votes coming in. Okay, great. Um, enough annotated data. Yep. Lack of data, lack of data, scarcity of data. <laughs> There's a theme data collection, how to store election identities. Yes. Uh, too much noise in the data. Yes. Explainability. Yes. Lack of domain knowledge. Yeah, that was a challenge. It took, it took a number of years. Spin flipping the problem. <laughs> Chemistry is hard. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Defining the objective. Yeah, yeah. Scaling, exactly. These are all very consistent with some of the challenges that we faced. Um, data was a huge one. Scaling, learning the domain took many years. Um, defining the objective. <laughs> Getting the data. <laughs> uh, great. Exactly. Yeah. Thanks for that. So, uh, go back to the slides. Yeah, exactly. So, we had many scientific and technical challenges. Um, on the scientific side, uh, DFT is a grand state method. So, you know, trying to start thinking about how we can also look at quantum mechanical methods that look at different molecule states or higher energies, which again is where a lot of the exciting and important and useful chemistry happens. Um, again, I mentioned the whole scaling challenges, so very complex large molecules uh, where you start to have even more interesting interactions like long range interactions. And when you start looking at solids, thinking about the effects of like periodic boundary conditions and things like that. Um, making sure that whatever it is we produced was actually practically usable in terms of speed and practicalities and making sure that we actually achieve that true universality. So, uh, yeah, in that data constraint environment, how can we make sure that our, our training data is representative enough that it really will be universal and can be applied to the whole broad range of chemistry that is out there. Practically, um, getting deep into the domain was very hard. It took us a number of years and working very closely with domain experts to be able to make notable progress um, and I think it's not necessarily the only way to make progress in using AI in a specific domain but it definitely gave us some unique advantages by going so deep and then yeah another kind of more practical challenge was you know building for multiple paths to impact when you're working on something that's so foundational can be a real challenge and actually I'm going to hand over to Brindy who's going to talk a little bit more about how we establish those paths to impact. Thanks a lot. Okay, uh, so let's go back to this tree of knowledge. So Annette talked a little bit about how we choose those root nodes, those foundational problems that we work on. I'm going to split gears a little bit and talk a bit about how we build those branches and leaves of the tree, if you will, or how do we take those foundational models and then build impact across different downstream fields and applications. Annette talked about quantum chemistry, which is one of the problems that we work on at Google DeepMind. I'll talk about protein folding, which is another area that we're interested in as well. Is there anyone here who's holder of AlphaFold? Does that sound? Okay, great. I will give a bit of background though. And in order to do that, I think I have to first start with what are proteins? So you probably have heard of the term proteins, kind of know what they are. They're essentially molecular machinery that is responsible for many of the functions in the human body and in other organisms as well. They're made of a string of amino acids. And that string of amino acids is folded in a particular shape. And that particular 3D shape essentially determines its function, how it works and what it does. Now, creating or identifying that protein structure, that 3D shape, can be really expensive and time consuming in an experimental wet lab. 
But if you can find out what the 3D shape is, it can be really useful. So you can use it to understand disease. You can use it to create new therapeutics, new drugs and medicines. And you can also create new proteins. So for example, proteins that have functions that are not represented in natural organically available proteins. We launched this uh, algorithm called AlphaFold a couple of years ago. Essentially what it does is it predicts that 3D shape. So you give it a sequence of amino acids, which are often represented by a string of letters like this one, put it through the model, and AlphaFold is able to then predict the 3D structure of a protein. So this is one example. You can see the green is the is a experimentally derived structure uh, by an experimental wet lab. The blue is the AlphaFold predicted structure. So pretty close. Um, for each of our predictions, we have some kind of success or confidence metric. Um, here we represented by GDT. That's the distance essentially between the predicted structure and the experimental structure. It's usually it has a maximum of 100. So here we're pretty confident in this uh, protein. Now I'm not going to go into the details of the model or the architecture. I have linked to the paper, so you can have a read up if you're interested in that. But what I will say is that AlphaFold is essentially trained on an open data set. So this data set called the Protein Data Bank, which is essentially a data set that was created by scientists around the world who have collected those experimentally derived structures over a number of years. And we use 100,000 of those protein structures to train the system. And now AlphaFold is able to predict the structure of any protein at scale and down to atomic accuracy in minutes. Now, when we develop a foundational model like AlphaFold, we know that it can be useful in a lot of different settings, contexts, applications, and fields. But thinking that through requires a lot of effort behind the scenes to make it possible. And we achieve this in a number of ways for AlphaFold. And I'll walk through some of those examples. First, we went down the usual academic route. So we published a paper, this time in Nature, and we also open source the code, so it's available on GitHub for both academic and commercial use. This is really useful if you have knowledge in machine learning and you have the skills to be able to use the methodology described in the paper and many, many papers, uh, many, many pages of supplementary information, or you're able to leverage the code directly from GitHub. But we know that AlphaFold is very useful to a broader community beyond the machine learning one. For example, if you're a structural biologist, you might not necessarily have the machine learning skills to use AlphaFold or might not even be able to code. And so we wanted to find a way in order to make AlphaFold useful to that community. So we partnered with Embel EBI, they're the European Bioinformatics Institute, and we built an AlphaFold protein structure database. So this database is available for free uh, for anyone to use, it has over 200 million protein structures, almost every protein that is known to man, as available for academic and commercial use. So if you have a favorite protein, you can head over to this website and set, type it in, play around with the 3D predictive structure. You can look at the confidence metrics, essentially find the information that you need in order to use that prediction. You can then download it and use it in other tool as well. One of the other aspects that we think about when planning our paths to impact is thinking about how do we release our AI models responsibly. And so we have a team at Global Deep Mind that help us think through how our releases align with our operating principles. So we commit to, for example, enabling social benefit, making sure that we review from a safety and ethics perspective. We make sure that we're accountable for the things that we release. And there are also certain red lines that we won't cross. So for example, we won't pursue harmful technologies, weapons, surveillance technology, or anything that would violate international law or human rights. So in releasing AlphaFold, we actually talked to over 30 different experts from biology, safety, security, ethics, to identify how do we release this treasure trove of information to the community in a safe way and minimize the potential risks. I think this diagram gives you a good idea of the impact that this database has. So the little purple, the colors look a little bit different here, but the little circle in the middle is the number of, represents the number of experimental 
protein structure that are available on PDB before alpha folds, and the large circle around it represents the number of protein predicted structures that are available through alpha folds today. This is quite a big jump. Now I'll walk through a couple of different ways that users of this database are leveraging it today, but there are many more stories like these, uh, and I'll, I'll point you where you can find those later. Now, malaria is a really problematic disease. In 2020, over 600,000 people died from malaria across the world, and many of them were young children in sub-Saharan Africa. There's a team at the University of Oxford that are using AlphaFold to understand the structure of a particular protein that is that they know is associated with malaria. And they're trying to identify which parts of this protein they should add to the vaccine that did, they're, de they're developing. So they're leveraging both alpha fold as well as human clinical trials to produce a more improved vaccine. Another area that we're aware that alpha fold is used in is in plastic waste. There's a group at the University of Portsmouth that are building enzymes to break down plastics. There's over 400 tons of plastic waste that are produced across the world every year. A lot of it ends up in landfills and in, in the world's oceans. And so this team are using alcohol to better identify the structures of the enzyme that they're working with. The last area I cover is a disease called osteoporosis, which essentially makes your bones quite brittle, where your bones break more easily. Now, traditionally, the way that you detect osteoporosis is through radiographic imaging techniques like x-rays. But these techniques can only detect osteoporosis once it's already developed. And at that point, it's actually really hard to control. There's a team at the University of Malta that are trying to understand how genetic differences lead to some individuals being more prone to osteoporosis than others. And so they're using alcohol to identify the structure of a protein that in someone who has a mutant gene compared to someone who has a normal gene. They are aiming to build a simple blood test so that young adults can detect this disease much earlier uh, and also help uh, develop better drugs as well. So these are three different areas that we know have been enabled by releasing this alpha database. There's a few more on our website, but there's many more in the community as well. And it's been great to meet those individuals every time we go to conferences and come up to us and say, this has been really useful in ways that we would not have otherwise imagined. Now, taking a step back in another way that we have impact, one of the advantages of being at Google is that we have this huge suite of products that have billions of users. One of those products is Google Cloud. And cloud is a great platform for us to be able to share our AI models in a way that makes it much more easier for the community to use. And so we worked with our colleagues in Google Cloud to essentially build AlphaFold into their life sciences platform called Vertex AI. So now there's a lot of commercial companies that are using AlphaFold too through that platform. In a similar vein, one of the other, one of the main areas actually that we're interested in when it comes to AlphaFold applications is in drug discovery. And so we actually spun out a new company under the AlphaFold umbrella that is reimagining the entire drug discovery process using an AI first approach. And so this AlphaFold is essentially the heart of this new company's platform. And they have their own machine learning team now and building a lot of different capabilities on top of that. Um, I know this team is hiring, so if you're interested, do have a look on their website as well. Taking a step back to wrap up this section, with this one foundational model of AlphaFold, you see that we've built a portfolio of impact across a lot of different products, communities, scientific fields, in a way that we wouldn't have been able to without that effort behind the scenes to think through how we maximize impact for that model. Okay, so Annette and I have talked through two scientific domains that we work on at Google DeepMind, but now it's your turn. So we would love to hear from you what challenges you would like to see AI apply to. Head over to Slido, and I'm excited to see what you come up with. Just give me a second.
right, we can see some lights come in. Everyone got it? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, quite a change is winning so far. <laughs> Amazing. This is great, a real variety of challenges coming up. Free parking slots. <laughs> Very impactful problem. Techno. Is that the music? Okay. So Twenty more seconds. Okay, I'm actually gonna um, ask anyone who said either climate change, education, health or policy making, if they wanna, or any of the others even, if you wanna share a little bit more about, you know, why you think it could be a very impactful area for AI to tackle. Yeah, go ahead. Go Okay. Uh, hi, thank you. So um, I'm a PhD student in economics. So I voted obviously for uh, uh, social sciences and policy making. Um, personally, I think that well, I, I know that there's a, all the decisions that at the end of the day are done by policy makers. They're way more effective when they're done with uh, evidence-based policies. Uh, thankfully, the UK where I'm living is a country that has learned the lessons and there's a lot of institutions doing that. But my country of origin, Spain, doesn't have that uh, history of doing evidence-based policy and it's very obvious to see. And even in development countries, does it that is even more obvious. So that's for that reason, that is uh, what I'm working on, uh, deep learning for econometrics and methodology. And I would really love to see in my work in those topics. Amazing. Thank you very much for sharing. It sounds like a very impactful problem. If anyone else is interested in AI policy making, you know who to speak to. Anyone else want to share why they thought any of these would be impactful challenges for AI to try and tackle? Yep, at the back. Hi, uh, my PhD and postdoc is on precision agriculture. So I think it's quite obvious why agriculture is useful because uh, human species, I mean, uh, we evolved through viruses and uh, through all the harshness, but after we, we managed to establish agriculture as a means of sustenance, then we started to evolve as, a, as cultures and as a, a intelligence and all things like this. So to me, actually, it's also a question why uh, companies like DeepMind is not actively involved in uh, agriculture since uh, the level of uh, implementation of AI in agriculture is quite low, I would say. And that's why I did the PhD there. <laughs> Amazing, thank you. Thanks so much for sharing. Maybe we've got time for another one, one more. We've got one here. Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, just like before, because my PhD is uh, related to this, I think AI can help understand human better, like uh, intelli human intelligence because all the previous research uh, is biased, okay, uh, because of its uh, nature. So probably AI can really find uh, hidden relations to data uh, based on uh, emotions, intelligence, personality, etc. Very interesting problem. 
great. Thank you so much for sharing. Amazing. Um, well, thanks for submitting your answers. I can see a real range of potential applications here, all very impactful, and some that are very topical for the Mediterranean and Greece, which is really nice to see. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. So we've come to the end of the bulk of our talk. And uh, I guess if you don't remember anything else from what we've said, uh, three key takeaways, and that is that, you know, we really do think that AI can be the ultimate tool to really help scientists across a variety of domains and those domains interact. Um, and when you're kind of exploring a potential domain and foundational challenge to impact with your methods, also think about the fact that there are many potential paths to realizing the impact that you're trying to have. Yeah. And we are definitely at the start of a new era in scientific progress. And we're so excited to see what's, what's going to come next. And we're excited to see what you all will work on. So please do keep in touch.